We are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour à toutes et tous. Uh, je suis Jonathan Paquin, je suis professeur. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Paquin. I am professor of political science at Laval University in uh, Quebec. And I focus on uh, the, well, I work at the uh, Network for Strategic Analysis, which is a collaboration between the Center of International and Defense Policy of Queens and the UCAM. And the goal is to mobilize the Canadian international expertise on three main axes of research that represent challenges for Canada. First of all, the evolution of the role of great powers in a context of questioning the world order in the framework as it is in the framework of this first uh, theme that we will have our conference today then we also have a second axis multilateral cooperation international security which is directed by Sarah Miriam Martin Brulé from Bishop's University and the third axis for research is the future of defense capacity building for global partners which is directed by my colleague, Theodore McLaughlin from uh, the University of Montreal. So welcome to this first colloquium for 2022 of the Network for Strategic Analysis. It is organized in partnership with the um, Institut Militaire de Québec and more specifically with its president, the retired Brigadier General Richard Giguère, who is the co-organizer of this uh, conference. The colloquium is entitled, as you know, the end of the Afghanistan war, its impact on NATO and great powers rivalries. Before we go any further, I must tell you that this colloquium is being translated simultaneously. You can- The language of your choice. The American withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021 raised many questions. What impact has the withdrawal had on the dynamics of cooperation within NATO? Has it had the effect of increasing some existing tensions within the alliance? And if so, which ones? We know, for instance, that the Biden administration's withdrawal created tensions with states like the United Kingdom and France. Both of them expressed their frustrations at the way the withdrawal was conducted by the Americans. And London and Paris concluded that they were too dependent on the United States for their own security. More broadly, what does the end of the Afghanistan war mean for NATO? Is it the end of the out of area operations uh, which were so important for the alliance in the last 20 years. The American withdrawal also raised questions about great power rivalries. Beijing and Moscow probably see the messy withdrawal as further proof that the United States is in decline and that America is retreating from the management of world affairs. So five months after the American withdrawal, have China and Russia taken advantage of the American departure to increase their influence and make geostrategic gains in Central Asia and elsewhere? According to national security correspondent for the New York Times, David Sanger, President Putin saw in President Biden's messy withdrawal from Afghanistan, a US president that was not in the mood to sustain long conflicts overseas. President Putin probably came to the conclusion now that now is the right time to make his move on Ukraine. The conference will also address uh, multiple uh, related questions, and all of these uh, questions will be addressed throughout the day. And I'm very happy and I'm delighted that um, you know, a great, uh, great experts, an excellent group of scholars uh, from many parts of the world will join us today to share their perspective on this topic. Our first panel moderated by Justin Massy will specifically address the issue of the impact of the US withdrawal on the competition between great powers. Later on, Ben Rosewell will deliver the keynote address. For decades, Mr. Rosewell was a Canadian diplomat and he notably served as the head of the NATO Provincial Reconstruction Team 
in Kandahar in 2009 and 2010. After lunch, our second and last panel, moderated by Brigadier General Richard Giguère, the co-organizer again of this conference, will focus on NATO. To all of you who join us this morning to hear about Afghanistan, thank you for being with us and have a great conference. And so without further ado, I turn the floor to Justin Messi, uh, the moderator of the first panel. Justin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, welcome to this first panel uh, of the day on the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan and its impact on the competition between great powers. I'm very pleased to have four excellent scholars to discuss this issue, timely issue, uh, of course, given the situation, as you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, uh, that's going on in Ukraine so far. We have experts on Russia and China that will be able to really decipher uh, the geopolitical impact of, of that withdrawal and its consequences that we can see, see still today. Um, all of the presenters' biography are on the program online, so I won't be reading everyone's bios. They're too long, too much, too accomplished scholars to, to read them all, uh, and I want to give more time for the discussion and for their own pres presentation, of course. Um, but let me briefly uh, present them to you. We uh, will begin with Igor Delanoe from the Franco-Russian Observ Observatory, followed by Pierre Jolicoeur from the Collège Militaire Royal du Canada. Nivaya will follow from the OSCE Academy in, in Bishek and fellow at the Eurasia Program of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. And last but not least on this panel, we'll have Tsingsheng Lin from the Université du Québec à Montréal. Um, colleagues, you have about 15 to 20 minutes to make a presentation followed by the others, and then we'll end around uh, 11 for a q and I just have to note that at 11, I'm expected elsewhere, so I will leave the floor to Jonathan to uh, handle and moderate the Q&A at 11. So without further ado, uh, Igor, the floor is yours. Merci, Justin, pour votre introduction. Je voudrais... Thank you, Justin, for this introduction. I'd like to thank by thank, uh, start by thanking the uh, Network for Strategic Analysis uh, for inviting me to this first conference 2022. I'm happy to be here to contribute. So I was asked to shed light on how Russia uh, perceived this uh, withdrawal from the United States uh, from Afghanistan. So. It is a withdrawal that is op opening up opportunities for Moscow, but which will also uh, pose certain challenges. It is a withdrawal that will, took the Kremlin by surprise because, uh, uh, first of all, because the Taliban took uh, control of uh, the country in Kabul very quickly, but also because of the modalities in which this withdrawal uh, happened, which was mentioned by Chantal. Russians, as others, were surprised by the uh, deeply disorganized and chaotic image that uh, will be imprinted in uh, everyone's minds. And this is uh, what was considered in Moscow as well. So how has this withdrawal impacted Russia and the ge geopolitical aspect of Russia? How was it perceived? And finally, how does Moscow want to face the new challenges posed by this American withdrawal from Afghanistan? First of all, I would say that the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan had has conforted, uh, confirmed a uh, wily widespread narrative in Russia uh, uh, that um, supposes that there is a decline of the Western world, a failure of the Western world. Of course, these images have uh, in a way confirmed this narrative uh, from Russia, but also this withdrawal or this crisis that uh, happened in the wake of the American withdrawal is perfectly in line with the uh, geopolitical pressure and the f and it is considered as a, a threat. Now, this Afghanistan episode is happening after a series of crises that have shaken the post-Soviet uh, states. It, there was 
uh, there's a war in the uh, in high Karabakh 2022 other conflicts in the post soviet region now in moscow moscow's partners are now exposed by uh, the uh, renewed presence of the taliban in kabul so there's a belt of crisis that we see appearing uh, in the area that is confirming this representation of a uh, the need to um, to fight against these political enemies and also there's a representation that is confirming the uh, besieged uh, feeling that is a very powerful feeling uh, among the political military uh, executives of russia now what are the challenges for moscow today uh, facing this new situation there are several challenges first of all for russians it is important to avoid a civil war in afghanistan that would be a, a violent fights between various uh, ethnicities and uh, so that afghanistan does not become once again an incubator of instability and an exporter of insecurity that's the first thing second of all they do not want to be manipulated by their uh, central asian partners they don't want to be drawn into a new war no matter what uh, shape it could take related to afghanistan and with that regards russia is quite uh, is 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 on its toes with tajikistan which is uh, moscow's central asian a partner that is most uh, worried because uh, so what is happening in kabul and they are the the, the, the tajikistan is the, the one having the the hardest uh, the, the most uh, it is the most opposed to the uh, taliban in kabul so there's a diplomatic regionalization there's a regionalization of security as well now let's talk about security russia has a certain credit uh, because of the uh, its military successes in syria which gives it uh, credit to its uh, position of a security stakeholder however this credibility or this determination can be put in question by moscow's uh, position in the high karabakh war in 2021 because the rush russia was a remit a spectator of the military uh, failure of the armenian army and they intervened uh, with Bakun Erevan, uh, this uh, in this treaty, but they didn't do anything before that. So, in the uh, in the framework of the uh, collective security organization, the Russia wants to offer a guarantee, a security guarantee, in the framework of the. Uh, of the OTSC, of the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization. So they have reinforced the security uh, in uh, Central Asia because in the case of the CSTO, Russia mobilized, uh, realized military exercises with several partners in Tajikistan and elsewhere. But in the framework of the uh, security and defense uh, partnership, Russia reinforced is a military uh, effective in Tajikistan, as I said. And we see that this, this uh, collective security treaty organization is the tool uh, fostered by Moscow, preferred by Moscow to deploy action in the framework of this crisis. So it is for several reasons. First of all, it allows Russia to uh, save face and to uh, save, the, save the face. It, in my, in terms of sovereignty and all as well because CSTO is very efficient in this type of crisis has been the case for several years there are ex military exercises that are happening since the uh, since 2010 to uh, eventually face uh, you know counter terrorism or counter drug trafficking uh, so they're holding uh, peacekeeping operations uh, with the collective security treaty or organization so in 2019 uh, they um, had uh, in Taji they held in tajikistan uh, peacekeeping uh, operations in kyrgyzstan they had uh, counter uh, terrorism exercises uh, so that gave them agility and experience uh, for the CSTO. And I think that what happened in Kazakhstan recently is also of a is also going to 
you know, confirm this Russian approach that is ready to invest resources and their credit to consolidate and help their partners, but at not at any price. We see that in Kazakhstan, Russians invested some military resources, but in a limited fashion, they are being flexible and uh, but limited, and the, but they did so to help Kazakhstan that was uh, facing challenges that needed to regain power within its own territory, so that the, the, the their power would not uh, would not fail. Now, once again, it's a signal to Tajikistan that Russia is there to protect uh, them from eventual uh, challenges potential confrontations with the Taliban, but it's not going to be at any price. And Russia will not uh, allow to be drawn uh, to uh, into a large scale conflict in Afghanistan. So the uh, in the Central Asia uh, region, the military, they have 5000 troops and a military uh, military forces in the 201st Russian base. And uh, so the and the so the two hundred first base uh, Russian base in Tajikistan is there, and they have uh, air, they have deployed these uh, these troops in Kant, and they they also have the director of the second Asian department at the Ministry of international affairs, the Russian ministry, which was, uh, this man was in Kabul between 2004 and 2009. This is uh, the, the ex-ambassador of Russia in Afghanistan. So this man was deployed in the area uh, because of his experience. And in July 2018, uh, well, anti Russia anticipates the uh, withdrawal, or anticipated the U U.S. withdrawal, and they uh, started having a dialogue with the Taliban in Moscow in 2018 to start discussing with them. And they were planning this, uh, um, foreseeing this uh, withdrawal from the United States. Now, there's a trialogue, Russia, United States, China, on uh, to which we'll uh, Pakistan will join in October, in October 2019. They had this uh, dialogue, trilogue. So it's important to focus on uh, Pakistan now because at the end of the Cold War, the Russians and uh, had very uh, bad relationships with Pakistan. And in the 1980s, the uh, Russians uh, failed to take over the country. But uh, the Russians were pragmatic. But in, since 2014, they have renewed this relationship. They rediscovered this friendship, and this partnership is just uh, growing since 2014 because they are now have a military uh, cooperation together. The, the Pakistan bought military uh, material from Russia, and they had the joint military exercises uh, every year since 2014 and there's also an a cooperation in terms of energy with pakistan with a uh the, the pack stream um, uh, pipeline and uh, russia should be associated to the construction of this pipeline so there's now a, a shift from the last 30 40 years a major shift happening and this shift is based on the pragmatic approach of the russians uh, who consider that uh, even though they can have excellent relationships with uh, partners they uh, must have a partnership a strong partnership with islamabad which is the uh, godfather of the taliban so in this partnership uh, russia might have more means to uh, act on the Afghan theater on which they don't have enough uh, as much control as they want. So now Russia has a multi-vectorial uh, diplomacy and they have constructive relationships with China as with India and Pakistan, but also with Iran. They're all uh, neighbors of Afghanistan and highly interested in what will happen in Afghanistan. So they have constructive relationships, but that still still remain uh, um, uh, challenges uh, with China, notably, for example, in the uh, in the uh, uh, 
in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that they're part of. There's another uh, challenge or issue is it is the corridors, logistical corridors uh, were created in the Caucasus after the Karabakh crisis. Uh, these were uh, economical and logistical corridors. Russia is also interested in building corridors between Uzbekistan and Pakistan through Afghanistan, logistical corridors. Now, these are still projects. It's very highly hypothetical, hypothetical given the uh, security uh, issues on uh, on the field. For now, these are projects, but Russia is working in, in that or orientation and they're ready to invest uh, funds in the Mazari Sharif Peshawar or Kabul Peshawar section to uh, allow Uzbekistan to have a, a window to the uh, Indian Ocean. And this would uh, allow to open up a corridor between uh, Far East and Europe that would be going through this section that I just mentioned. And now this uh, brings about competition with China, because we know that China is promoting other quarters uh, in the One Belt, One Road initiative, notably, that we know quite well. The third element in uh, at the intra-Afghan level, I said that Russia does not have, not have enough leverage. We can see that. There is no military technical cooperation. They have very uh, low, uh, uh, there is very low cooperation between Russian uh, Afghanistan. There is no trade, no energy cooperation between both countries. There is no pipeline. So Russia's uh, Russia doesn't have any lever to use on Afghanistan. So now they have to uh, build this relationships, the relationship through Pakistan. So today there's an item they can focus on. It is their um, intra-Afghan. Uh, dialogue capacity so they can have they have a dialogue with uh, pretty much all forces in presence uh, for example the taliban with uh, various uh, tribes and uh, ethnicities and today's uh, objective the moscow's objective is to create an afghan government that would be more inclusive uh, this is uh, a project dear to uh, Amir Kabulov. So for a long time in Paris and Canada, uh, this goal was uh, very present, but uh, Moscow wants this Afghan government to be more inclusive, not only made up of Pashtun members, but they want Azaraz, Uzbek and other ethnicities so that they could um, avoid uh, hostile conflicts or civil war. So they have a much more proactive approach than uh, what they had in, for example, in the in the Congress of Peoples of Syria in January 2018, or they can act as a moderator among the various uh, uh, stakeholders. Now they have a much more proactive approach. They want to be not only moderators, but they want to uh, foster dialogue, take part in the dialogue and take part actively in the dialogue to um, obtain consensus and facilitate the emergence of this inclusive government. So to conclude, uh, I have four points to uh, that I want to focus on. So Russia now is not an outsider in Afghanistan anymore. It is now a macro regional power that has acquired, that is acquiring more and more influence on, uh, with that regards. Second of all, uh, as I said, it is intervening at the regional level, in, but also at the intra Afghan level. And uh, to do that, it has a, an image that is better than we could think because today uh, various investigations show that uh, Afghan, Afghans uh, hold uh, NATO and uh, and, and the West uh, responsible for uh, for the the conflicts and for the, the their problems instead of Russia, which was the case 30 years ago. And there are red lines that should not be crossed. For example, the no, Russia can will not do any military intervention, uh, but for now they do not want to see any U.S. or NATO bases in Central Asia or not uh, more bases. Um, we know that uh, the U.S. had bases that they were using to deploy drones to uh, to, uh, 
to undergo operations. So now it's uh, Russia will not accept such uh, action. And the last point, I tend to see this new Afghan crisis or this uh, post withdrawal Afghanistan um, as what happened in Belarusia and in Karabakh in 2020. All these crises allow Russia to reaffirm its security leadership and that is to uh, take back control over a space uh, that we thought they had lost for very uh, different reasons. But in a general rule, it allows Russia to uh, regain leadership and reaffirm its security leadership in a space that is a zone that is considered as vital and strategic for Russia's interests. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Igor, for this excellent presentation on Russia. Let's continue on this topic with Pierre Jalicoeur, who will talk about uh, Russia's uh, position. Pierre, thank you. So I will, I'd like to take a moment to uh, share my screen. So I will present some items and which uh, will do a follow-up on what was just presented by Igor Delanoy because the topic that was suggested to me is pretty much the same. But um, I will bring about, uh, sh shed a light from a different perspective. Um, first of all, I'm going to uh, address the impact of the uh, regime change in Afghanistan for the uh, states of Central Asia. Then I will focus on Russia. And Mr. Delanoe gave us a presentation on that. And then I will present the perspective of cooperation that the new geopolitical uh, reality represents for Russia and China. And I will also focus on the challenges of this cooperation. So the impacts of a change in regime in Afghanistan for Central Asian states. So the, the return of the Taliban is, uh, is a source of uh, fear in the region. First of all, it's a, a fear of security based fear. So uh, due to the threat of terrorism, uh, now there could be a return to the 90s where uh, jihad action uh, was uh, ha happened in Afghanistan regularly. The second concern uh, relates to drug trafficking. So a good part of world production of opium is from Afghanistan. Now the uh, routes taken to uh, export this uh, opium go through other states of Central Asia, uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, other countries of the region. Now there's a concern about migrations. If there's a civil war in Afghanistan, thousands of people could take refuge in Central Asia where there is no desire or capacity to welcome them. And sometimes, oftentimes, the public local authorities frown upon such uh, migrations or such entry of foreigners in their country. And there's the concern of jihad action. So there's a concern that the new uh, government, the Taliban government, could export their powers under the form of jihad action. So which of these concerns are the most relevant? Here's a map to show you the routes uh, taken by opium, opium uh, from Afghanistan. So it goes through Central Asia, goes to Russia, uh, among others. More than 20% of opium consumers are in Russia. So let's get back to the concerns I've exposed. The first concern about drug trafficking uh, is real. However, it can only develop with complicity of uh, border uh, officers of the country. So it's a false problem. Uh, it, it, it is irrelevant to uh, raise the concern of drug trafficking uh, on the uh, part of the Taliban. 
the Taliban have uh, fought the corruption, state corruption, and the uh, under their government in the 1990s, there was less uh, opium export than there is today. Another concern that is non-founded is migrations. So in 2014, with the beginning of the American withdrawal, dialogue with the Taliban and Russia started again. So since the return of the Taliban in Kabul, the recent return, uh, Turkey that Turkey that is not that does not share any border with uh, Afghanistan receives more uh, more refugees from Afghanistan. So the main threat on the ex USSR countries is the terrorism uh, threat. Once again, concerns are often exaggerated. For many years, the terrorism uh, uh, terrorists, notably from Uzbekistan and other countries of Central Asia, were a threat for for uh, the, the, the great powers of the region. But starting in the 1990s, jihad military, military from Central Asia were integrated, integrated in uh, other bodies of, uh, of jihad uh, groups. And they were re, uh, replaced by other terrorist groups in Afghanistan. Intervention militaire américaine depuis 20 ans, hein, surtout en Afghanistan, mais aussi au Proche-Orient, hein, en Syrie, euh, ont neutralisé une bonne partie de ces groupes terroristes qui étaient originaires d'Asie centrale. Aussi, il faut noter que le contexte terroriste mondial a changé. The world terrorist context. You have to say that the whole terrorism it has changed in the world. The jihad threat is no longer Al-Qaeda, but the Islamist state armed group, which uh, has a chapter in Afghanistan. This is the uh, Islamist state, which is the uh, enemy of uh, Afghanistan. And so risks coming from Afghanistan are overestimated willfully by the Central Asia components because Afghanistan enables the Central Asia regimes to maintain their authoritarian uh, government or to maintain insecurity. So we've seen an impact on the Central Asia society. And so, but this is, this differs geopolitically. The great victory of uh, Taliban in Kabul uh, shows how fragile and how legitimate this government is in spite of what the U.S. has done. And this constitutes a um, major defeat for the United States and for uh, Western countries consequently. So this defeat is in the context of a world situation where we see that democracy is going backwards, uh, benefiting a more authoritarian regime system. For Central Asia, this means more concre concretely that rival countries, um, China, Russia, against uh, the Western world, are uh, progressing in the region. Second part of my presentation, interests of Russia, specifically uh, to Central Asia. Russian interests, mainly they are geared towards security. Its main objective is to make sure that the northern four borders of Afghanistan are less secure with Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and, and um, the need is to protect their own southern borders against the Islamist uh, state activities and threats, terrorism, and drug trafficking. So I've said yesterday that these issues seems seem to be exaggerated. We cannot uh, discard them easily. To face that challenge, Russia strengthened its uh, security interest in the region. So we see this map, uh, and we have Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and so on, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and we have in Tajikistan, the region, where we have a base, a base with 5,000 Russian soldiers. It's the biggest military base uh, for Russia in the region. It's even bigger than the current 
Syrian deployment. Russia was able to re-equip its um, uh, army with new material in uh, Tajikistan, new uh, infantry combat vehicles, infrared missiles, last generation models, and um, torches, uh, anti-tank um, missiles, and so on. 30 new T-62 tanks have been bought, which means that Russia is increasing its military capacity. This is being uh, renewed, refreshed if you want. The material is new so that it can be more effective if needs be in the region. So beyond the material and weapons, there is also repair. In August, while the Taliban, in 2021 rather, while the Taliban were making some new ground in the north of Afghanistan, Russia had organized some military um, or exercises with Uzbekistan, Tajikistan in the territory 20 kilometers away only from the Afghan territory, which shows that the three countries are really determined to maintain security in the region. In reality, Russia tries to use the OTSC, the Collective Security Organization, uh, of which uh, Tajikistan is part of. But this is in Uzbekistan in order to be the main provider of security in the region, opposing forces there. After the U.S. defeat and the Taliban victory, Russia can now persuade the Central Asian countries to strengthen the collective safety net that exists, uh, where the, uh, that they're part of, or TC, and then uh, to convince Uzbekistan or other countries to join forces with CSTO. So we see the borders of uh, Central Asia with Afghanistan, in Tajikistan, and so on, where we find some military bases. Russia can then show that they are more reliable than the Western world in order to ensure security in the region. As was mentioned some time ago by Igor, this new strength was uh, well seen at Moscow's summit on October 20th, 2021. After the Afghan crisis, this was a meeting with uh, 10 regional states where they were able to harmonize their policy regarding the new Afghan regime, dialogue with Taliban. And also there was the objective to marginalize the uh, in, in intrusion of Western world action uh, from, from those Western countries and also the reconstruction of the Asian region. More convincing even in Kazakhstan, Russian troops were sent recently after what happened at the beginning of the month because of the uh, spike in energy prices after chaos that was raining over at the time after the Kazakh uh, request, Russia has deployed 3,000 soldiers quickly in order to uh, reestablish public order uh, in the framework of the mission from CSTO. Russia has withdrawn its troop once the order was gained back through its intervention. Russia was able to show that they could act fast in a decisive way without asking any counterpart commitments. So I'm sorry, I'm trying to show you some pictures uh, depicting chaos in Afghanistan and Russian intervention in Kazakhstan. Third part of my presentation. Possible cooperation with China, possibilities after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the possibility that uh, stability could come back in the region in order to ease cooperation between China and Russia in August, while Taliban's were getting nearer victory, Russian forces participated for the first time in the military exercise that was organized by China in its own territory. This is the joint Western 2021 maneuvers. This was based on the anti-terrorist initiative in September. Russia and China have created uh, another maneuver, a joint military process uh, under the supervision of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with the different forces from the region. This process included also uh, initiatives to fight against terrorism. Russia and China have been organizing since 2005 joint military um, initiatives in the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Initiative. This is uh, mainly or uh, well against anti-terrorism because of terrorism threats that could come from Afghanistan. China and Russia are collaborating and they want to rest on that experience in order to implement common 
or a joint military uh, initiative in Central Asia. Now, we see cooperation um, possibilities uh, in the region, but with China, we see some challenges. Besides those uh, cooperation uh, possibilities, tensions uh, might um, emerge with Russia, between China and Russia, rather. Uh, the uh, rapprochement was created between both countries, but nonetheless, Central Asia was always a great source of tension. China is more and more interested in the region, which threatens Russia, which wants to assert itself as the dominating force in the region. Both countries up to now have, relatively speaking, managed this situation well. And uh, in 2015, they agreed to link the EU and Asian uh, economy with China in order to create the new uh, union and the Silk Road. China has tried to reassure Asian countries and Central and Asian countries, telling them that economic development is possible, not just a, a political uh, or military strength. Many people think that China and Russia have uh, signed a tacit agreement in order to share tasks in the region. Russia would remain the main supplier of foreign uh, security, whilst China would be the very engine of economic growth. But this argument was never convincing, indeed, because of its greater economic interest in the region. China would have reasons to want to develop its very political experience, thus increasing its security role in the region. In reality, they started in 2016 working with Tajikistan and the earlier Afghan government in order to guarantee the security of the region. During the last years, China has supported the construction and the strengthening of uh, border control sites in Tajikistan, increasing Pakistan's security strength, building a base also for the mountain uh, forces in Afghanistan near the Afghan corridor here. Uh, you see this uh, with a small border with China, uh, between China and Afghanistan. China also has built some bases for the armed police, the people's forced um, troops in Tajikistan and would have established a base in Afghanistan, even though this was never confirmed. All these activities could create tension with Russia. However, China's security commitment in the region does not necessarily mean that their intent is to supersede Russia's power in the region. Their objective is to guarantee security mainly in the sectors or fields that are more concerning to them more directly, i.e. its border region with the Western world. Instead of ensuring, I mean, Russia, instead of ensuring security uh, in terms of the economy, uh, i.e. China, I mean, China and Russia, what I want to say is that they could um, focus each one on specific zones in order to guarantee the security and to break uh, that, uh, down that responsibility in the region. But there, China's intrusion might exist in terms of the regional security because this was a field which was the very exclusive, almost prerogative of Russia. Russia seems to accept China's effort in order to secure its national border, which goes through uh, cooperating with neighboring countries. For the long term, China could strengthen the presence of its security forces in the region, decreasing de facto the role of Russia. How can Russia perceive that very evolution if China would want to protect not only its very own borders, but also its investments a little bit uh, further away at the very center of Central Asia? This is an open-ended question, and it remains as such. We conclude the withdrawal of the United States, the, the withdrawal of the United States and Central Asia has created the uh, rise of a new balance of powers. China and Russia up to now have managed things in a very fluid way, but tensions might reemerge, which would thus create new challenges afterwards. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Pierre, for this presentation, which was very interesting. It's a complementary to the earlier one, and this will be a bridge and lead us into the next presentation. Before giving the floor to my colleague, I'd like to stress the point that for all of those who are listening to us, please start preparing your questions for our different speakers. Around 11 o'clock, we'll consider your questions, and you can use the Q&R functions in French. Uh, this is the Zoom 
question and answer function. Anyway, uh, jot down your questions on paper if you want, and we'll, we'll consider them when we deal with the questions. So all of our presentations, our speakers, our different panel members of today will also be able to participate in this conversation if there's anything that you want to um, resume with your colleagues and mention. Anyway, you'll be able to do that. Without further ado, we'll continue the discussion towards China more specifically. Niva. Um, unfortunately, I don't speak French, but hello to all my French speaking audience and colleagues. Okay. I'm also going to be mindful of the time as well, since we have been so good so far. Um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, which I'm very excited about. Um, so the I work for the OSC Academy. Um, it's an education institution and think tank based in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, under the European Security Organization, OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Economic Cooperation in Europe. I'm a resident researcher here exclusively studying China affairs in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Um, I have about 15, 20 minutes, and mainly I want to um, talk about, you know, kind of the more recent history um, and not go so far into um, the relationship between China and Taliban, you know, way back in the 90s. I don't think it's relevant anymore, um, at least from the perspective of, you know, looking at what's happening um, going forward and for policymaking. So um, in my very short um, speech, I will talk about how China, the People's Republic of China, responded to the U.S. announcing their withdrawal in the 2010s. I will also talk about how China responded to the aftermath of this withdrawal um, and how China responded to Taliban's presence in Kabul. During these two periods, I will also um, talk about, you know, what were China's calculations and interests during these um, two periods. So first, um, China does not desire instability in Afghanistan and the region at large. Because of American presence in Afghanistan, China was able to enjoy uh, a relatively free and stable environment in Central Asia for its uh, investments in the oil and gas sector. There are two China Central Asia pipelines, one for gas and one for oil. Uh, to give our audience a little bit of perspective, China, uh, the whole of China imports 40% uh, of its gas, natural gas needs from overseas. And about half of this 40% comes from Turkmenistan. So this is the statistics in the 2021. So Turkmenistan, of course, is a, a very important energy uh, actor for China. Oil is a little bit more of a complex story because of uh, domestic use in Central Asia. Uh, and there's also a lot of processing deals with China uh, in this region because this region doesn't have high quality refineries. So there's a deal of, for example, giving crude oil to China to get it processed there and then send it back. And this is not part of um, uh, bilateral trade. Anyways, with um, these uh, key investments in oil and gas, which is, uh, you know, in itself is 80% of uh, trade between China and Central Asia anyways, is, you know, all oil and gas. Um, China have, have been able to use this, you know, as economic leverage to sustain its political interests. Um, and, and, what, and what is this interest precisely? Is combating the East Turkestan movement. You know, that is in China's eyes, uh, ethnic Uyghurs from Xinjiang who wants this region to be independent uh, as its own country. And regionally speaking, China has been making sure that no Central Asian governments will back this independence movement of Xinjiang. Um, the economic investments and the economic leverage was enough uh, to do this. The PLC has captured most of the elites in Central Asia via investments into state-owned assets in the oil and gas sector and uh, other minerals, which in turn help strengthen the local rulers um, in their own countries, uh, uh, you know, alongside with the companies of elites and so on. Uh, so, you know, tackling this political interest precisely uh, locally, it means closing down associations of ethnic Uyghurs. Um, history of the Soviet Union is that, you know, a lot of ethnic Uyghurs, you know, back in the day, you know, the borders are not so, uh, uh, so strict, huh? like today, they're very fluid. So a lot of ethnic Uyghurs actually live in Central Asia, and they used to have a representation, you know, by association or by schools, whatever, uh, they have a presence in, in this region, but many are closed 
because um, of China's pressure. Many are deported in secret. Um, there are numerous cases uh, here in Kyrgyzstan where uh, businessmen even uh, were reported missing by their family. Uh, the po local police were even looking for them. And then it turns out they were somehow uh, ended up in prisons in China and they, there were no records of um, them leaving the country here. Those who illegally cross the border from China into Central Asian states like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan are denied rights to asylum. Uh, all of this uh, uh, has shown to us that uh, China has uh, been able to um, convince the leaders here to um, protect its political interests. Uh, we have to keep in mind that during this period of time uh, is the most one of the most vulnerable time in the Xinjiang. Uh, I recall the uh, 2009 ethnic clashes in Xinjiang, which was well, one of the most deadly um, ethnic clashes in China uh, uh, in, in the recent time. And of course, uh, Central Asian countries were very aware of this and the leaders are also very aware of this, but they helped China to manage this regionally. But uh, this was only until the United States started talking about leaving Afghanistan. Uh, China has been put in a very difficult position to step up, to maintain regional stability and continue to show to its Central Asian ally that China is committed to this region. Um, like the previous panelists have already mentioned, um, Afghanistan is a breeding ground for a lot of other international terrorists uh, and they only move around. And Central Asia is the region that they're interested in. Uh, and you know, we can see that from um, a lot of different videos, a lot of different speeches that uh, converting Central Asians' uh, uh, current Islamic faith into the Islamic faith that they find correct uh, is a goal of some of these international terrorist groups. Uh, in this past decade, um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was mentioned a little bit, has uh, increased in scope. I will not go too um, deep into you know, how exactly this organization has uh, increased its world and you know, what does it do on the ground, but uh, it is a, uh, you know, important organization. I think a lot of um, experts, you know, also used to debate the role of the Russia CSTO and used to say that while CSTO is, uh, you know, is a kind of, uh, we don't know what it really does. We don't know, you know, if it has power. Well, a few weeks ago in Kazakhstan, of course, we see that CSTO does have power. I think this goes to the same as SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, just because it hasn't done anything drastic doesn't mean that it doesn't have the capacity to do something drastic in the future, and it has. Um, bilaterally as well, China has been conducting uh, many regular military exercises in the region, providing military trainings for Central Asian armies, donated a lot of equipment, built a lot of security infrastructure here for free. There are several Chinese-built border posts um, on the Tajikistan-Afghanistan border. And on the Chinese-Tajikistan border as well, there are fences, cameras to uh, monitor illegal cross-border activities. What is more interesting is actually the high altitude airports that China is building on the Chinese side uh, of the Central Asian um, border, which will enable air force mobilization um, and through bilateral exercises, we can already see that China is incorporating its air force to work with Central Asian states. So this is something very interesting. Um, and all of this security engagement uh, with China is new in the region, right after the United States says that, says that it will withdraw from Afghanistan. And in uh, official speeches, uh, we can see that you know, China is doing this precisely uh, to increase the military capacity in Central Asia and with Central Asia, uh, uh, to be prepared uh, for what is to come in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan itself, there was not much that China can do uh, in this period of time. China did step up efforts to open dialogue, uh, build friends on both sides with Taliban, even uh, with different Taliban uh, leaders privately. Uh, China was mindful that the situation can change very quickly, harming is uh, two key interests. Um, one was, uh, uh, you know, it's important that uh, international terrorists are contained within Afghanistan and they're not looking elsewhere like Central Asia. Um, they are also uh, talking to uh, the Afghan government, the former Afghan government. Um, China tried this uh, initiative called uh, Economic for Peace uh, to keep 
elites in Afghanistan uh, who worked for the Afghan government and their associates to balance the Taliban in Afghanistan. So for example, uh, when China said that in 2016, uh, Afghanistan will be incorporated into the China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, you know, this was, you know, part of that economic for peace initiative. Regionally speaking, Central Asian uh, countries in recent years also want to be connected to South Asian economies. I think uh, I, uh, I already said just now, you know, this uh, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan railway uh, economic corridor uh, is actually something that Uzbekistan, even without the interests of Russia, uh, is very keen to develop because of the sake of its own economy. Um, China and Taliban, there were private talks, uh, even cases uh, where um, Chinese intelligence cells were busted in Afghanistan. It was uh, so much about monitoring on the ground. During this period, um, what China wanted to know in Afghanistan was you know, the, the movements of the ethnic Uyghurs. So it is not a, a secret that there are also ma many ethnic Uyghurs living in Afghanistan, um, be they militants themselves who work for the Taliban, or they are wives and families of uh, Taliban members um, who live and work alongside Taliban. And China, is, of course, is interested in their movements. Um, they might not be members of the East Turkestan movements, um, but they can be friends or, or, or families of, of them. Um, and, uh, you know, China consider, you know, this, uh, uh, this group of ethnic uh, minorities, you know, Chinese diaspora as well. And uh, as we know, China is, China is interested in Chinese diaspora, no, no matter where they end up. So this is a very natural for China. But none of these discussions with the Afghan government or with Taliban actually went very far. And there were no other options for China to do more. Now, after the U.S. withdrawal, we have uh, Taliban in Kabul. It's a different time for China already. Uh, in uh, this year and uh, last year, we can see that China has enough capacity at the moment to keep out the East Turkestan movement away from Xinjiang. Uh, you know, the, the, um, the equipment and the mobilization that is already present in Xinjiang uh, is the best containment policy. The threat doesn't come from the Wakhan corridor. Um, it, it has no capacity to, to penetrate that border. Um, and it doesn't come, you know, the threat doesn't, it's not against Xinjiang itself. China's main concern given the current situation is about revival of the East Turkestan activities in, the, in this neighborhood. Um, keeping in mind that China has spent the past 20 years uh, through different means to get rid of their activities. If Afghanistan becomes an even more attractive hub for international terrorist groups, these activities, including those of the East Turkestans, will overspill to Central Asia and China. The regional concern is that Central Asian populations are very concerned and interested at the same time about the situation in Afghanistan. Videos uh, back in August um, were in wide circulation. Many here actually supported and found rationale in Taliban's notion of social justice regarding corrupt politicians and on you know, women's issues. Before I mentioned that China had captured most elites in Central Asia through investments, and that's true. It's not a secret that they are associated with corruption. And in the past few years, it has polarized, this corruption has polarized the relationship between local elites and the local people. There are many protests in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan that were related to this precise corruption between local elites and Chinese companies. Many local analysts here worry that Central Asians, the, the, the common people, will find radical Islam as a way to counter these corrupt politicians. This is too the worry for China. How religion and ideas of the Taliban can be used by religious groups in Central Asia to gain political power. Now, back to China and Taliban. China has been consistent in calling for an inclusive government since uh, you know, uh, early last year to cut ties with all international terrorist groups, uh, calling for the Taliban to work regionally with other countries and to establish good relations with neighboring countries. And this was quite consistent you know, for a very long time. Up until Taliban, 
uh, entered Kabul, which was 16, 15, 16th of August, China was still also at the same time calling for a stable and productive Islamic policy in, in Afghanistan. But after Taliban took over Kabul, this was gone from all the official speeches. China knows it is in no position to bargain with the Taliban on Islamic issues. It is in no position to sell you know, a group, uh, China's Chinese ideas, which has risen to power, you know, what kind of state policy it should pursue for the future. China has no economic leverage in Afghanistan and it needs to create economic leverage in, in Afghanistan to secure effective communication. And Taliban can actually use this channel um, of Chinese uh, financial support to maintain its rules uh, in areas where the Taliban leadership does not necessarily have a full grip on. And in exchange, China can secure some basic demand. This is, um, this is you know, the idea. Uh, we're not talking about minerals, like China is not interested about minerals now. We're only talking about roads. There are no roads in Afghanistan because of the war. We're talking about you know, cross-region electricity lines, the most basic infrastructure uh, which are absent in Afghanistan. This will be a welcomed move regionally, including Pakistan and India. This is something that um, you know, China has been you know, talking about. The roads actually will even allow US policy in this region uh, uh, to connect Central and South Asia. And this is uh, of course also welcomed by Central Asian states, particularly Uzbekistan. Um, and China of course has the capacity to not just fund all these roads and all these electricity lines, but also send the people to build them. But the only bottleneck right now is that Taliban is not fulfilling China's demands. They will not abandon their friends, the Uyghur population in, in Afghanistan. We need to keep in mind that some Taliban members support the visions of the East Turkestan movement. They want an Islamic neighbor in the East. At the same time, we also have to keep in mind that China is unlikely to be satisfied with whatever the Taliban will promise or give. Right now, the short to medium concern is radicalization in other Central Asian states, particularly in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which has a very large population of young men studying religion overseas. If this enters politics, China worry that these narratives will overspill to Xinjiang because of human, human exchanges, which were open after the pandemic, and the family and business links between Central Asia and Xinjiang. For now, we can see that uh, China is giving humanitarian aid to Taliban is the only thing they're doing. There's been several rounds of vaccines, food aid, uh, and some different supplies for the winter. And this keeps communication going. This puts Chinese officials and the Taliban on the same table talking about what to do in 2022. There's been no signs yet of Taliban fulfilling Chinese demands. At the same time, the Taliban is already looking for regional travel, which again was China, you know, was one of China's demand is to, you know, have a good relationship with neighbors. Um, but the Taliban is already asking for travel. It has recently asked for military planes back from Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. These planes flew from across the border during the fighting in August, and they belonged to the Afghan government's pilots. Uzbekistan toyed with the idea of cutting electricity to Afghanistan, actually. Uh, this was the end of last year, uh, and it did briefly uh, cut down about 60% uh, of electricity supply to Afghanistan. And then a few, few days later, uh, uh, renegotiated a deal again with the Taliban. The details are not disclosed to the public, of course, but since then, there's been no more de demands from the Taliban about these claims. When China thinks about Afghanistan, Taliban on its own is already very difficult to deal with. Um, at the same time, it has to navigate working together with leaders in Central Asia. And this is a challenging balance that Beijing has actually no time to prepare for with no friends around in this region. Uh, a few weeks ago, before the unrest in uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping made two phone calls to celebrate the 30 years of diplomatic relations between China and Kazakhstan. The first call was uh, to the first president of Kazakhstan, Nazambayev, and she called him an old friend that the two had deep personal friendship. With Tokayev, the current and the second president of Kazakhstan, 
they were all simple uh, diplomatic speech because Xi Jinping uh, and leaders in Beijing understood Nazambayev as the true person that was calling all the shots in Kazakhstan. Now that Nazambayev is ousted, uh, Beijing has lost a key friend in this uh, very much increasingly destabilizing region uh, besides Afghanistan. Let's um, keep watching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niva, for this great presentation. Uh, on va maintenant uh, passer à la dernière panéliste de ce. Uh, we will now move to our next panelist. And once again, I will invite all the members of the audience to prepare their questions in preparation for the Q&R period after the end of this uh, panel so that we can present them to our uh, great speakers and allow for an exchange between them and you. Without further ado, Ting Sheng, the floor is yours for the last presentation in this panel. Thank you, Justin. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer of this panel for inviting me. Uh, so I can share with you some insights on the position ad and attitude of China, China on the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan. So first of all, I'd like to go a bit further as usual to see what in the history of diplomatic relationships between Afghanistan and China can shed light on what will happen or allow us to foresee what will happen. So. There are a few interesting characteristics we can find in the last that happened in the last 50 to 60 years of relationships between the, both countries. It is an attitude relatively passive that we see from the Chinese perspective. So before Afghanistan. the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, there were already two, two um, coups that had happened, but the Chinese government recognized immediately uh, within a few weeks, the new government, and uh, they have started reestablishing diplomatic relationships with Afghanistan. But now uh, in 1979, with the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, uh, it provoked a very violent reaction from China. And China did not cut off the diplomatic relationship with Afghanistan at the time. The embassy is still there. There are no commercial or cultural or normal exchanges anymore, but the embassy is still in Afghanistan uh, until the uh, withdrawal of Soviet troops and Afghanistan uh, went through chaos, civil war, and when the United States came to Afghanistan, that's where the relationship between Afghanistan and China was cut off. So it's rather the internal situation and stability of Afghanistan that determines the diplomatic attitude of China. So this is an interesting situation. It's giving us um, some explanation or uh, cues as to or clues as to why China refuses to recognize the Taliban regime while uh, uh, they've been there for six months. So and they're waiting for China to uh, make a move. So the Taliban are wondering if they would uh, have a benefit from um, from interacting with China and they want to, they, they, they promised China they would protect Chinese interests in Afghanistan. So, so of course, there, there, was some, uh, there was some unrest in uh, Oriental uh, East Turkestan. So this might have, uh, might have caused some problems in the relationships between both countries. And we also see that um, we, all, we also have some insight on what could happen in the future. China is trying to have bilateral relationships. They don't want to work directly with the Taliban or with the, uh, the Afghan government. Uh, that was under the American uh, influence, but they tried to use other means of uh, communicating with the uh, with Afghanistan to share responsibility, to find a way that would be stable. So what we 
saw since 2009, China, through the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, tried to establish uh, some form of contact and regular activity with Afghanistan. And oftentimes, uh, the, uh, the chief of state of that country uh, met in conferences, meetings, and regular uh, Shanghai cooperation organization meetings met with uh, the authorities. So we see that they're going to keep using this channel to establish a regular relationship with Af and stable relationship with Afghanistan. The second, the second means that China is trying to use, which is very important, is and this is uh, at the base of my presentation, it is the role of Pakistan. So I think one of my colleagues already mentioned that there are there's a dialogue between China, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. China knows quite well and understands quite well the importance of Afghanistan for the Pakistani, for the Pakistani government. These are their direct neighbors, and they have very tight and close relationships be bo between both countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And Afghanistan's attitude uh, facing India is uh, causing uh, uh, concerns for the Pakistani government. And Pakistan, let's not forget it, in the whole world is the only eternal friend of China. Of course, the Qing Gong uh, Un in uh, North Korea, yes, but the strongest, most constant uh, friendship around China, with China, or in any place in the world, is the uh, Chinese and Pakistani relationship. That is the only thing that can qualify, uh, the only country we can qualify as a true friend for China, for China uh, in the world. So, so in Afghanistan, whether it's the Americans that make decisions or if it's Russia that wants to have an, a greater influence over Afghanistan, China will discuss that with Pakistan and work hand in hand with Pakistan over this issue. So Pakistan will not make decisions unilaterally, but they will discuss with China. China will say yes, and they will work together. They will act jointly. That is what we, uh, that is what I feel when I read the information re research produced by Chinese researchers. That's the impression I get. Now, let me get back to uh, an important point, uh, information coming from uh, Chinese researchers that are analyzing the American withdrawal. Uh, what about the consequences and problems with this withdrawal? So mainly all Chinese researchers try to give the impression that this American withdrawal is a huge strategic failure. So Chinese researchers did not forget to use this opportunity to criticize this uh, intervention and this war that is deemed unfair. Now, of course, that's what they do in China uh, all the time. They consider American action, action as unfair all the time, but this is another opportunity for them. And we see that the Chinese are start trying to, or starting to integrate some uh, way to analyze things in the Western way, that is to give a more detailed analysis of relationships and links between strategies, operations of a political and military nature. It's interesting. This is the first time I see that Chinese are trying to set aside uh, the art of war approach, and they're, they're trying to use the uh, the Klauschwitz uh, thought process and and approach. That's interesting. But for Americans, it's going to be a humiliation. And the second thing, Chinese researchers are trying to assess the impacts of this uh, American uh, withdrawal. So what concerns the Chinese is that there is now a, uh, the, the American have left off a, an open space in this region, but it's well, the Chinese prefer see, seeing this situation, this eventual instability, 
through the Pakistani lens. So is it, uh, is it going to be, the Chinese are wondering if it's going to be important for Pakistan, if it's going to be an issue for Pakistan. Uh, so of course there will be an, an empty space and we're going to come in. No, they're not going to do that. That's why uh, I said, well, will China come into the cemetery of empires? I think that uh, China a few centuries ago in another dynasty when they had uh, conflicts with the uh, Islamic Abbas Empire, they, they learned not to get into these regions. That's one thing. But with the impacts or with this security concern that's always focused on the Islamic, uh, uh, the Islamic um, situation in uh, East Turkestan. Now, is it going to um, taper down or is it going to become is it going to worsen? So, so they're used to working together with Pakistan, and they are. I don't think they the China wants or has decided yet to go into Afghanistan. They want to wait, observe and act through their eternal partner and friend, Pakistan, to find a solution to resolve this problem. So once again, China, uh, and this is the same thing that happened before the Soviet invasion, China prefers to act indirectly. So the, the China prefers to uh, to trust Pakistan in acting. So they don't have a lot of countries they can trust. So that's why they will, uh, they, they don't want to be more isolated. So that's why they're being very careful and they're like letting Pakistan act and they're acting directly through Pakistan. And they're concerned about Pakistan's needs and wants. So another thing that is becoming an issue or permanent automatic reaction is the Chinese American relationships. Whenever something happens, there is always calculations or factors or elements related to uh, the evolution of the relationship between the United States and China. So the Chinese are trying to look at this through two lens. So they don't want to be too optimistic or too pessimistic, of course. They're trying to look at things from both sides. So this, anti this, and then there might be a consensus or a conclusion, uh, a more exhaustive conclusion to the matter. So for Chinese, uh, Americans are withdrawing from Afghanistan. That's a good thing. But in the meantime, there are very negative impacts coming from that. So Biden justified, tried to justify why the Americans withdrew. One of the reasons was that the Americans need to focus their resources on things that are more important. So what is that? That is competition against China and Russia. That's what's most important. So we won't continue investing or, or uh, throwing billions of dollars in these sectors that don't give any return. And uh, we will use, they will use their other levers with China and Russia. So if they come into this region where they have less influence, that's a good thing apparently. But the pressure that uh, Americans remove from this region will uh, show up elsewhere. This is a bit materialistic. Sometimes this point of view works, but the Chinese uh, see that they can, uh, they don't need to go into Afghanistan. It'll save them a lot of resources. And Americans see that um, they want to focus elsewhere in the Indian, India Pacific region. So the Chinese are waiting. They're on their toes. And they will uh, provoke situations such as the one in the, uh, the, the, the Taiwan Strait. So this impact is re directly related to the geopolitical change that happened in this region and it is having an impact in other places in the world another thing is that uh, we should wonder if it might it, it, there might be a possibility for, for cooperation so although this hostility or rivalry between Chinese and United States have exist, has existed for a long time, we can see that the Chinese government never sets aside the possibility of having a dialogue 
with whoever. For example, in the climate change matter, we see that China is ready to uh, sit down with the Americans to discuss. So in the uh, Afghan stability issue and the uh, drug trafficking and anti-terror issues, Chinese, the Chinese are ready to cooperate or uh, discuss with Americans. So they are already having meetings between China, Russia, and U the United States that are talking about how they could resolve this problem or how they could work together. Uh, they know that they know who they can talk to. They can, know they can talk together and they know that they are great powers that can uh, work together. So, But China wants to be there to say, hey, I'm a stakeholder in these negotiations. There's So the Americans will not act unilaterally anymore. In this case, China is happy to play this role, this new role, because in this trilogue, China is trying to, um, to uh, help their eternal partner, Pakistan, once again. So Pakistan is taking part in these meetings. And let's not forget that there's a big uh, strategic project that China is now promoting. That it is the, uh, the uh, Silk Road, or the Silk Belt Road. And now there's a type of project that will be directly affected by this change that happening Afghanistan, it is the Chinese-Pakistani uh, economic corridor. Now there are situations, uh, security issues, uh, international stability issues that are at play here. And once again, China has concluded that stability or instability of Afghanistan is directly related to Pakistan. Americans have understood that for a long time, well, a long time ago. So now they are, China is trying to decide if they should, uh, everybody was trying to decide if they should increase the amount of troops. Biden was the strongest in this process. The main problem is not in Afghanistan, it is in Pakistan. So Americans know the situation. So there's no reason why Chinese would not understand that. So throughout this whole story uh, and near the near future, we will see that China will address these issues and decide which activities and which steps need to, they need to go through. And they will consider the most important thing, which is the opinion and the position of Pakistan and the impacts for Pakistan. That's my conclusion. Thank you very much. If there are questions, it'll be my pleasure to answer them during the question period. That's the first time that I finish on time, Justin. Yes, and thank you very much. Uh, Ting Sheng is great. You, you warned me at the beginning, now we're in a good position. Thank you all, and thank you to the other colleagues for um, respecting the time allotted to you because that will allow us to have an exchange among yourselves, because there are several uh, things from your presentations that are overlapping. Uh, that said, I will let Jonathan Paquin um, facilitating this uh, questions period with the audience, because as I said earlier, I need to leave. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be with you and uh, see you soon. Thank you, Justin. Thank you to our four speakers. And all I did learn quite a lot about uh, uh, a lot of issues. Um, I guess uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is, would you like to get back to one another? Is there something that like to, you would like to say about what has been said already by, by the other panelists? Uh, and if not, I do have a couple of questions and I see that in the Q and R we have, we also have questions. They're rather long questions. So um, what I can do first, uh, ce que je peux faire d'abord et avant tout, c'est vous poser uh, une what question. What I can do first is to ask you a general question and you can answer them uh, one at a time. I'd like to get back to the stability or instability in Afghanistan. Obviously, with the arrival of the Taliban at the end of August, we quickly realized 
for those of you who, of us who were not looking at Afghanistan anymore, that another political force was present in uh, the country, the uh, Islamic State of Khorasan. Pierre mentioned it in his presentation. This group, this organization, considers that the Taliban are traitors, that they collaborated with Americans. So their goal, from what I understand, is to uh, overthrow the Taliban, to uh, to create a much more radical state in Afghanistan. If the situation were to become highly problematic in Afghanistan, if the country should um, fall back into chaos, what would be the response from China and Russia? Could we anticipate a stronger presence from uh, their uh, behalf in Afghanistan? Or on the contrary, do you believe that China and Russia would only try to uh, to wait for the situation to improve. So for those of you who would like to comment that, uh, please go ahead. I can uh, make a comment about Russia, if I may, Jonathan. If we look at the scenario of a catastrophe you're describing, uh, you know, at a, before the intervention, there was uh, chaos. Well, there was throughout the American intervention. I think that for Russia, I don't foresee any direct military action from Russia in this scenario. However, I see a reflex would be a safety belt through the fortification of Tajikistan, which has already started, as we said. So the consolidation of military uh, strength to increase the military presence and strength would probably happen. Potentially, there would be a... Uh, a, the use of proxies uh, that is to uh, discuss with elements in Afghanistan, uh, maybe they would provide indirect military support, but I don't see any scenario where the, Russia would uh, uh, intervene militarily, uh, presentially in Afghanistan for reasons we understand. Another scenario that could happen in a second step if there was a... Uh, a, an escalation uh, reaching a plateau in this conflict, I would not exclude the intervention of Russian private militia of the Wagner type, but that would uh, entail that there would be strong uh, Russia, Russian uh, economic uh, stakeholders uh, locally, which is not the case yet. But if they came in, this is a high uh, hypothesis, uh, Wagner type private militia uh, from Russia could intervene, but they would not get into the conflict. They would, uh, they would uh, probably limit themselves to protecting uh, strategic sites and they would not uh, take part in uh, Afghan internal dynamics that are that are external to them. So thank you very much, Igor. Pierre, would you like to add something? Uh, I agree with my colleague Igor, but I, on the short or long term, I don't see any will from Russia to in, get involved militarily directly in Afghanistan. So they will probably want to reinforce security uh, points on the border, but Russia might want to support through uh, sending military material uh, to support uh, opposition groups that would want to take control of Afghanistan and possibly support the Taliban, because I suppose that the Taliban in your scenario would not be completely eliminated and they would keep fighting against the uh, Islamic State group. So in this scenario, Russia could, and this would be a, a very spectacular change uh, in the course of things, but Russia could want to uh, defend or support materially and possibly diplomatically the Taliban. But beyond that, I think that the, the, the Igor's response was quite complete. Neva and, and Tinsh. Uh, chaos w w would come back in, in Afghanistan. Uh, maybe Neva first, if you, uh, if you want to add something. Yeah, I think at the moment, um, the way that we are seeing Taliban right now is so deprived of um, so many things. One, um, international recognition. Um, two, money, access to the bank accounts of the Afghan former government. 
Um, recently, the Afghan uh, ambassador to China um, left his job because he revealed that he was not paid for the past six months uh, after Taliban took power. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is also the case of many Afghan diplomats around the world. Um, Taliban is, you know, has no access to money and of course no one has access to the accounts of the Afghan government. So these are very practical things that um, the Taliban is dealing with. Um, you know, it, has, uh, it has been shown that it does not have a good relationship with its neighbors. Um, you know, I think the strategy of the international community right now is just staffing it out um, until the Taliban is willing to make a very concrete commitments, um, you know, in dealing with, you know, the presence of, um, you know, other um, prominent international terrorists and, you know, um, waiting for the Taliban to make a commitment to integrate um, itself and also integrate its country to, you know, the modern world. I think we're still waiting to see that. And in the meantime, um, China, like the rest of the international community, are just giving very minimal aid. Um, so this is the strategy is right now, whether or not a conflict, further conflict will be, break out between Taliban and the other uh, groups in the country um, will depend uh, on whether or not uh, Taliban pursues um, such policy instead of um, reaching out to the world. Thank you, Niva. Uh, Ding Shen? Oui, merci. Uh, je pense que c'est uh, encore dans la logique. De... Thank you. This is still part of the rationale that the Chinese government thinks about. Uh, will there be stability or chaos within Afghanistan? The first one to be impacted the most, as was the case with uh, refugee flows that will immediately get into Pakistan. Stability within Pakistan will be impacted also. Pakistan is a country that looks like authoritarian, it looks to be very militarized, but there are very unstable components comprising those countries also, the, the country. That's for that reason that the economic corridor or belt has uh, uh, been faced with a lot of difficulty. The Afghan instability will be impacted directly. The um, Pakistani instability also will be impacted in terms of the core strategies as pertains to Chinese geostrategy. This will become a negative impact, which will, in turn, strengthen things. Conversely to what the U.S. state has done, uh, when they views the, the strength of India in order to mitigate China's effort in the region. So we have to be extremely careful about that. With the caveat that we can trust the Pakistani government, because they can react, they can find solutions, and the Chinese behind their own uh, curtain can provide suggestions. That's how I suppose that the Chinese government would do in terms of method. They would deem that this would be the most adequate uh, solution or in order to face that context. Thank you for that possibility. Thank you so much. Now I'll consider some questions that I've just uh, welcome from uh, our listeners, those joining us for this uh, conference. I'll read this uh, slowly so that the interpretation be able to be provided without great difficulty. The question is the following. This is written by Jean-Noël Berube. He writes, China, Russia, and Iran has just started today, as we speak, on January 21st, joint military maneuvers with um, mm, Air Force and uh, uh, Sea Forces um, um, initiatives. The idea is to create a military association between the three countries. Uh, and should this be concerning for the NATO forces? And these three countries have uh, joint borders with Afghanistan. Should this be a matter of concern for NATO? This is a um, hot off the press in terms of threat, maybe. I don't know if people are cognizant of that. I don't know if you're aware of those military maneuvers. If yes, I'm really interested in knowing what's your point of view on that. Jonathan, uh, if I can say something, if I may, these are maneuvers that have been announced. This is not something that uh, all of a sudden out of the blue uh, occurred. No, this is planned for a long time. Had a, a go, this was planned for, and so regarding timing, this happens while the 
uh, uh, President Raisik from Iran was in Moscow and he intervenes and this happens also while discussions are occurring in Vienna in order to uh, revivify JCPOA. I don't know how to do that, but this is a very harsh discussion that's being held for a few weeks, if not more. And so we know that in that very context, Russians and Chinese are, how should we say this, um, opponents, you know, in the context of the JCPOA. So which this aims at consolidating the posture from Iran, how they will negotiate things, and trying to bring support in a more uh, asserted way vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Iran's uh, government. Now, these military maneuvers exist bilaterally. This is, um, again, um, the, there's a, a lot of... With Iran and China, there's a tradition that I would say, uh, a minimum level intervention in that, regarding the zone, regarding the Indian Ocean. I don't think that NATO should be concerned by that. Uh, I mean, we have other concerns than what's happening in the Indian Ocean, but this is a zone that's at the crossroads of several interests from Tehran, Moscow, and Beijing, because Iran want to export energy. Chinese need that, really. Russians, uh, that's the main energetic powers. They are really impacted by whatever might impact the energy sector. This is a hot zone in terms of uh, tanker transits, transportations, freights, and so on. The very idea is to show that there's a relative convergence of opinions in the region. Relatively speaking, there's stability, given the context that I just told you about. If there's bad news for anyone, uh, I would talk about uh, Israeli, because mainly Israel has adopted a very harsh line against Iran. They always want to opt for more sanctions, more containment of Iran. And so to see Chinese and Russians uh, assert themselves so clearly with um, Iranians. Anyway, this is not critical maybe, but I just want to say that there are questions that uh, Irani, uh, I mean, they want to buy new military material from uh, China. Irani don't have money, by the way, in order to be able to purchase such material. But I think that this is part of the very context they wanted uh, to go for some military co cooperation. Yes, thank you. What's your point of view on China? Reaction of China? Anybody else? Do you want to say anything about that? I think that, um, again, some uh, sea maneuvers, this is quite tricky, because China is fully aware of the fact that they are trying to play catch up in, the, in this field. They're a bit behind. Uh, so the maneuver process regarding the armed forces, it, it's easier, easier to catch things up you know, in terms of land forces, when you want to create a cooperation model with allies. But uh, regarding the, I mean, the uh, naval forces, I mean, we've added the Air Force also. And so this is one of the strengths uh, as pertains to the US and for NATO. That's what it means. But there's a long way to go for China. They know that if you want to play catch up. So in, well, quantitatively, China is already a big naval force. And so we, in comparison with uh, the allies and the US and Western allies, they still have a long way to go before being able to catch up. But it took 15 years for China to be able to uh, participate in anti-piracy anti, uh, activities. And so we we're just starting to see what their capacity is because now they can say, okay, we can send our boat, our naval forces, uh, they can go one step further, a little bit further away. The Indian Ocean is one of the communication sea waves, that, sea waves that's extremely important for the Chinese economy. This maneuver will continue. And so this will continue no matter what partner participates in those activities. So at the same time, This can be a symbolic action in terms of timing to, to show something, but for practical reasons, 
if ever something happens there, uh, support is necessary from other people. It's not just like uh, picking up the phone and asking for it. You need to reset some communication channels or parameters. You have to practice these things. Rehearsing is boring, but unless you practice things in time of a critical intervention, this will be total chaos. So you need to prepare things ahead of time. You can't look at things from a point of view that depicts the situation as being too grave. But these are very significant. Otherwise, you know, every two years, uh, the U.S. Uh, forces uh, do maneuvers with uh, Pacific forces and hundreds of boats and their partners and so on. This is not just war games. This is not to simply to show how proud they are, to brag about their great powers. No, there are very practical, pragmatic reasons that are quite useful. Uh, and this is quite valid uh, for such um, uh, military maneuvers to be held. Thank you. We only have less than 30 minutes for the remainder of the conversation. There we have other questions, Niva. The last question. Um, the translation is actually a little bit delayed, so I oh. always um, never get to really jump in. So which, um, will you repeat the question, actually? Sure. So uh, China, Russia, and Iran uh mm -hmm. are um are doing military exercise these days mm -hmm. uh in the indian ocean mm -hmm. and uh and the objective is to prevent uh uh piraterie and i forgot the word in english but uh, um mm -hmm. so it's it's maritime security uh, essentially mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. so would you say that that kind of uh, military exercise uh, is seen as um uh, as a potential problem for NATO, uh, or or what what does it say to you? I mean, I'm not sure how you know relevant is is this to our topic mm. of today, being Afghanistan. I think you know, right. I think Ego uh, also mentioned that you know all these developments are something that was you know planned, and you know just because it's signed uh, uh, so sure. recently doesn't you know uh, necessarily ref reflect what is the you know current affairs of today. I think. You know, apart from that, um, you know, the the, the tri-alliance of Russia, you know, China and Iran, I think one of the, the other most important thing is actually the inclusion of Iran into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization last summer, um, you know, because part of many of the practical containment strategies that China and Russia has is uh, making sure that the borders are sealed uh, around mm. Afghanistan and having Iran included in the SEO, um, you know, being the second uh, most uh, country with um, Afghan refugee um, has a lot of implications in, in terms of border control um, and the kind of names and intelligence are shared between the border guards of uh, the SEO in this region. So I think that is uh, more important. I'm not sure what kind of implication this has for NATO. I think if anything, um, I think what we're looking at is, you know, increased security engagement and willingness to uh, engage in security sector between China, Russia, and Iran. I don't think this is, you know, any of surprised um, to us. I think it's a very natural, uh, uh, you know, kind of consequences, you know, of this kind of alliance against uh, the West, uh, if, if we were to call it that. Um, I think in terms of um, sea trade, uh, you know, a note that I wanted to, you know, uh, add on to uh, Professor Lin is that, you um, you know, sea-based trade is important to China, but precisely because there is so much U.S. Uh, naval dominance on around uh, the sea and around sea-based trade, China is building an alternative land-based trade uh, route across Central Asia. Uh, this is the so-called middle corridor that cuts through Kazakhstan uh, and then goes on to uh, ferries on the Caspian Sea into Baku, Azerbaijan, hop on a train, uh, to uh, Tbilisi, into Turkey, and then into Europe. You know, this land-based trade route, of course, has only been in the making for the past 10 years, but with time, uh, the Chinese government is funding it uh, with so much subsidies, it will be a uh, alternative um, if the sea-based route were to be interrupted. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Neva. Uh, another question that is uh, probably more related to the uh, topic that you were discussing earlier uh, has to do with the Taliban as, as a political regime. And there's one question from uh, Frédéric Côté that was uh, sent earlier. And the question is, considering that the Taliban government uh, is an important geopolitical factor in, in the calculation of so many uh, states in the region, 
Uh, is it something? Is there something that that China and Russia uh, are doing uh, to make sure that the Taliban uh, remain a sort of cohesive or coherent force? Is there something that they do to prevent the radicalization of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan? Uh, and if so, it, would you say that the approach of China and Russia uh, uh, is different from the approach of the EU or, or the United States with respect to, uh, you know, the, the Taliban and, and uh, in Afghanistan? Mm. Okay, so, so I, that's I'll my own first. translation of, of a question yeah, that yeah. was written in French. <laughs> right, no, so. no, no, it's great. Why was right. you know why I still remember and why you know we're still on the English channel, right? Um, <laughs> no, I would say you know I think you know we have to remember that you know China and Russia has you know very different interests when it comes to the Taliban. You know China has very direct consequences and very direct uh, direct demands that they want from the Taliban, while Russia you know, don't really, you know, this is miles and miles away from Russia. Uh, of course, it is interested in Afghanistan because of regional reasons, because of, you know, global uh, kind of uh, conflict interests, so on and so forth. But China's interest is much more direct and is much, much more urgent. Um, like I said, you know, China hold a lot of private talks with um, different leaders of the Taliban. You know, Taliban is not unified, as we know. Uh, it is divided by many fractions across many different parts of, Af uh, of Afghanistan. And then on top of that, uh, uh, there are also uh, ethnic leaders uh, that are, you know, live in different parts of Afghanistan that the Taliban, you know, not, not necessarily have control over. Um, I think that, you know, China has failed to uh, unify their voices precisely because of this uh, ethnic Uyghur factor. Um, many Taliban uh, members are not, uh, um, they will not abandon their friends. Um, I think this is very natural when you have uh, fought alongside and worked alongside with, um, you know, uh, uh, people for, you know, the past decades, you will not just uh, abandon them um, just because, you know, they are not uh, Pashtun or whatsoever, not from Afghanistan. Um, and for Russia, you know, I think that, you know, these talks are, are, are much more, you know, less immediate. There is uh, not many uh, um, demands, so to speak, that, you know, Russia necessarily needs, although uh, other experts might, you know, say that Ch uh, Russia also has other urgencies. But I think from the Chinese perspective, um, you know, it's, 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 so far it's, it's been quite hopeless um, to unify. And in my, you know, some of, in, in some of my conversations with um, especially some of the former um, intelligence officers and, you know, military officers that, you know, used to work for the Afghan government that just, you know, got out of Afghanistan, uh, you know, past six months, is that, you know, the, the Taliban is, is extremely divided um, on China. And I think at this point, uh, January 2022 is not a, a secret that the Taliban is very divided um, on whether or not to work with China, precisely because of this, um, you know, Islamic question, precisely because of, you know, whether or not they, sh they, they can abandon their friends. I think this is a very big question. Xinjiang uh, shares a border with Afghanistan. It has historical ties. Um, it has, you know, very concrete interests. You know, the Uyghur diaspora overseas has interests as well in Afghanistan and, you know, contacts, so on and so forth. Um, I think it's very difficult right now for China to manage this. And I think that um, this makes it ever more important, you know, to capture uh, and to hold on communications with all parts of Taliban members and to, you know, start to induce um, the economic leverage that China likes to use um, elsewhere in the region and the world. Thank you, uh, Niva. Uh, I, I have a question for, for Ting Sheng. Uh, Ting Sheng, tu, uh, tu mentionnais tout à l'heure que la You said earlier, this was very interesting, you said that China was looking uh, at Afghanistan through its relationship with uh, Pakistan. During the whole Afghan war, Western countries were complaining about the fact that Afghanistan was not being uh, honest in their strategy that on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, they were working alongside with the Western coalition, but they were working on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday with the Taliban forces. You know, that they were playing these two parts at the same time and uh, people complained that way and they were using, evoking that idea. So China is supporting Pakistan because uh, there's a dual role that's played by Pakistan wearing two hats somehow. Can you give us more information about China? What was China doing regarding its relationship with uh, Pakistan to 
um, maybe uh, harm the U.S. interest in Afghanistan. We shouldn't just focus on Afghanistan. Before something occurs in Afghanistan, already before that, there were a big geopolitical context that was set. This was the triangular uh, relationship between China, India, and Pakistan. So the relationship, or, I mean, there was hostility between Pakistan and India. These hostile elements, I mean, they, this was uh, up to China. China opted for Pakistan as a partner for the long term. This is a choice that was made. It's a contextual choice. It's not because the Chinese share the same values as the other country. They don't have common roots with Pakistan. They don't share any cultural traits with them. But it's just because of the Cold War, because uh, they were on the side of Soviet Union. And so they, they would have to opt for another one. So uh, they prefer for this relationship to last for the long term in China. And... Uh, we must choose some side, and so that's why they up that. And so uh, what complies with this criterion means what? I'm giving you a lot of endearing uh, thoughts in as much as you do this. It's conditional. That's why in the case of Kazakhstan, always there are former friends that all of a sudden were overthrown, so they were caught by surprise somehow, and they were in an embarrassing situation. Consequently, China inevitably should look at all the elements of, from South Asia with a first concern in mind, the very situation prevailing in Pakistan. The Pakistani context is not ideal. It's not a country where you have a huge economic growth. No, uh, there's no in, um, domestic stability either. So it's a friend that needs support that needs help, if they've chosen Pakistan as a friend already, then they must try to be consistent. And that's how the Chinese are thinking, mainly. Instead of saying, okay, this country played this role in the past, and uh, there was the war in Afghanistan, and because of that, uh, things happened. And then they're starting starting to challenge uh, their uh, credibility. So China is looking at the Pakistani's uh, reaction during the, the past years, all along. Because for Pakistan, what's important, if we look at the strategic calculation of uh, Islamabad, Pakistani, they want to avoid as much as possible a situation whereby they would send, a, 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 they would create an Afghan regime that's close to India. That's what they want to avoid. And this would be extremely, but that would be a great peril for Afghan, you know, on both sides. Uh, that would be seen as being very dangerous. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm long-winded, as you know, as always, I speak too long for too long, but the U.S., um, but the forces, I mean, their reputation is to use a partner and they get rid of it when they don't need that partner anymore in the U.S. So people have seen situations like that. Everybody thinks about that, right? Everybody agrees on that. So uh, the Pakistani do not trust um, the Americans and uh, they won't comply with the U.S. requests. They won't be sincere about that. The assassination or uh, Ben Laden's uh, killing or execution within the uh, Pakistani government without any prior notification. So the Pakistani were extremely uh, angry and they shut Afghanistan, they, they shut their borders. So all the logistic uh, possibilities were um, uh, not possible, and so they had to go through Afghanistan to uh, get some troop supplies. Anyway, there are friends that are always consistent, they're friends forever, and there are people that use you, they abuse you in a utilitarian way. They're your friends in an opportunistic way while it lasts, while they need you. So that's the lesson we should learn, maybe. The disdain attitude, maybe, that exists. People are not really concerned about others. This attitude has to change. 
Thank you. Um, we only have five minutes left before Ben Roswell's um, keynote presentation. I have a broader question, which is beyond um, Afghanistan as a topic. This is a question about tensions, significant tensions that are occurring. Uh, the struggle between um, the US, Russia, NATO regarding Ukraine. Not only that, but anyway, Pierre, first of all, do you want to say something about that, that struggle? And uh, if you want to add anything else uh, for other people, to what extent the very discussions and its dynamics, the diplomacy uh, discussions between the US and Russians is monitored in Pekin? And what's the impact as pertains to um, a conflict resolution in that conflict? What could be the impact on China and the US and the relationships, uh, the relation regarding the Taiwanese file? What's the link between Taiwan and that issue, between these two themes? Again, uh, the conference of ours uh, wasn't supposed to deal with that, but I mean, I'm, I'm surprising you a bit, but what do you think about that? Is there a relationship between Taiwan and the whole struggle between the US and Russia? I'm surprised indeed, but China is monitoring what's happening on the Ukraine front. This might be an opportunity for China to see that uh, tensions with Russia and NATO country members, uh, that this would offer opportunities to China. But beyond synchronicity, it's a matter of timing, I, I think, really. China also entered into tense situations with the Western world, notably regarding Hong Kong, Taiwan, and other stakes which are specific to China, other challenges. So maybe they might be able to benefit from the uh, opportunity to increase their pressure ex uh, on other challenges which are specific to China, knowing that Western countries are mobilized currently and totally focused on the Ukraine front. Beyond that, I don't have a lot of feedback to provide you with, so I haven't prepared anything now. So anyway, I, I don't know what uh, the Chinese uh, considerations are regarding this. Thank you. We don't have a lot of time. If you want to talk about that, do you want to address this? Is there a link between those two topics? I've talked a bit before, so I think I, I feel uh, that I must say something. Now, this is not scientific. It's not science-based, but... I suppose that there's something being negotiated. Is there an orchestration of a scheme under the table or is it on the table since the very beginning? As per Ukraine, this has occurred for quite some time, but all of a sudden things are uh, being even more uh, troublesome. So since the very beginning in India and the Pacific region, there have been struggles. This is not something that pertains to Biden. This is a long lasting issue. It's been there for quite some time. Uh, they want to use Taiwan as an issue to weaken China. This has occurred already. And uh, the idea was to have a series of things in the work for that. Now, is it because China is feeling a pressure that's being exerted so that things are becoming more and more difficult for them, not only from an outside perspective, given their geopolitical environment in that context, or from within China, maybe there are pressures being exerted because people are criticizing China, people saying you're too weak vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, and people are criticizing also their government saying, well, they're becoming, uh, Taiwan is becoming more independent and you Chinese government, what are you going to do? Are you going to let uh, uh, Taiwan flee and so on? Maybe they're negotiating or maybe they want to celebrate a, an anniversary with Putin. But anyway, will you alleviate the pressure? Because I am now being on the U.S. limelight. But anyway, help me and so on. There are things that are non-science-based, but these types of discussions may occur because we don't know what's happening uh, backstage or... Uh, we don't know what the nature of the innuendos is. Thank you so much. This is the end of the first panel. Igor Delanoy, Pierre Jolica, uh, Pierre Chauli, Niva Yell, thank you so much for participating in this first panel. This was very informational, very interesting. And I know that we are all extremely busy for you to join us for taking the time to do so. So we're, this is so very important and endearing. First, thank you so much for your participation.